Well, welcome everybody. I think we'll, we'll get going now. And um, uh, my name is Diane Coyle. I'm Bennett Professor of Public Policy here. And it's my great pleasure and privilege to be introducing this lecture this evening. Let me start with the housekeeping. Um, the event is being filmed, so please turn off or turn down your mobiles. And we're going to have time for questions and answers at the end, and some people will run around with uh, roving microphones. So, uh, so we'll have that opportunity later. The um, ST Lee Lecture honours Dr. Lee Seng Ti of Singapore, who is a, a great benefactor to the university and Wolfson College. And his intention in establishing this lecture series, was, which was founded in 2001, uh, was to provide a forum for Cambridge to uh, discuss the relationship between scientific, medical, or technological research and public policy. And the recent lecturers have illustrated the scope of science and public policy, just how big that domain is. For example, Steve Chu, Nobel Prize winning physicist and energy secretary for four years under President Obama, spoke about the urgency of climate change as an imperative for innovation. Vijay Raghavan, the principal scientific advisor to the government of India, spoke about the vital role science and technology must play to ensure the sustainability of the planet. Jacqueline Poe, the founding chief executive of the Government Technology Agency of Singapore, spoke about digital transformation of the public realm. So already a sense of, of the broad scope that we've covered in the lecture series. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Sheila Jasanoff as the 2022 Dr. S.T. Lee Public Policy Lecturer. Sheila is the Fortzheimer Professor of Science and Technology Studies at the Harvard Kennedy School, and of course, a pioneer in her field. Her work explores the role of science and technology in the law, politics, and policy of modern democracies, with particular attention to the nature of public reason. She was founding chair of the Science and Technology Studies Department at Cornell University, and has held numerous distinguished visiting appointments in the US, Europe, and Japan. Sheila served on the board of directors of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and as president of the Society for Social Studies of Science. It's a real pleasure to welcome Sheila back to Cambridge, where she was a Levy Hume Visiting Professor in the Departments of Geography and the History and Philosophy of Science in 2005 to 2007, and where she's a life member of Clare Hall and an Associate Fellow of CSAP. This evening, Sheila's going to talk about the role of experts in democracies during the times of crisis. So it's my great pleasure to invite Sheila up to the stage to deliver this year's ST, ST Lee Lecture on Democracy and Distrust After the Pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane, for the kind of introduction and above all for agreeing to chair this session. Thanks also to Rob Doubleday and all of the staff and members of CSAP for waiting for two years to uh, bow to my wish that I not have yet another virtual lecture to commit to. And thank you to my friends and uh, other members of the audience for being here tonight. And of course, thanks to uh, the generosity of um, Dr. S.T. Lee for making these uh, occasions possible. So uh, what I want to do today is not, um, probably not what most of my predecessors in doing this lecture series have done because we're midstream in something that actually may not ever end. So I was thinking of democracy and distrust and the notion of after the pandemic. In some sense, we will always be after this pandemic and democracy and distrust are likewise terms that have been with us for thousands of years. So we're not about to resolve anything and move on and turn the page and say, we have solutions. Um, so it's more of a speculative moment. In some sense, we're all caught in inscribing with our own lives a piece of speculative fiction. You know, what happens when the world, the social world as we know it, is called to a halt for two years and everybody in it becomes an unconsenting subject to this vast experiment? How do we come out of it? and what happens to our lives as we pick up the pieces, we don't know yet. To some extent, we're living through that experiment and will be doing so for 
many years to come. Um, so uh, it would be folly to say that I have conclusions to offer in this moment. I do have, I do have reflections. And those reflections I will interweave in a certain sense. So one thread of my reflections will come from the field of science and technology studies and the ways in which we've been thinking about crises confronting knowledge and political action for now many years. And the other thread is an STS scholar experiencing the events of the world, in a sense, on her own skin and wondering you know, what to make of things in the moment. So this is very much a history of the present as well. And uh, with that, let me um, introduce the topic still further. So where does one encounter the word trust? And if you're an American, one of the first places you think of uh, is the $1 bill carrying the motto of the United States, in God we trust. Um, and if you are steeped in thinking about science and technology studies, any claim like that immediately makes you wonder, well, what makes it stand? How is it that we trust this thing called the $1 bill? Um, and um, you know what all underwrites it? So this is a building that no longer stands. It is the, uh, the first mint of the United States. And we can all talk about you know, some of the things that the Mint and the Treasury of the United States do in order to allow this dollar bill to serve as legal tender. It's a vast infrastructure that sustains the trustworthiness of that piece of paper. So of course, at the material side of things, there are these identity markers, the nature of the paper, which you're not allowed to make unless you're producing legal tender the US. It's backed up by a state promise that whatever this thing is worth, the state stands ready and willing to make sure that you're getting value for money in a literal sense. There are safeguards against people <laughs> falsifying and producing counterfeit currency. And there are detection systems of different sorts. I mean, some of you may be aware of this, others may not be, that the tragic murder of George Floyd last year began with a storekeeper recognizing a bill as being counterfeit, and that set in motion uh, an entire chain of events that has caused a political upheaval, a firestorm in the United States. So these social and mechanical detection systems are very much part of why we trust this piece of paper as it passes around. And then, of course, we trust all kinds of mediating institutions. So there are banks that issue you money, now largely through ATM machines. There are stores that accept and don't accept. And any of you who've traveled in the global south may have experienced a much greater degree of suspicion about this economy of exchange. I am, of course, Indian by origin and go to India very often. And I don't know how many times my husband and I have been told that people will not accept a thus and such piece of paper because it's wrinkled or it has a little tear in it or it looks more faded, you know, as if it's been run through the laundry. It's very rare to have that happen in the global north, but in, you know, it reminds you that these economies of exchange have rules of their own and they operate different ways. And the social practices as well. You don't take you know, a, a bill from a stranger in the same way that you do from a friend. It's passed through a set of credibility mechanisms of different sorts. So with all of that set of understandings about trust in mind, of course, I looked a little strangely when these kinds of signs began appearing in our neighborhood. So you stick Fauci instead of God, and what is the underpinning, what is the infrastructure that causes people, ordinary citizens of the US, to start putting these kinds of lawn signs up on their lawns? You know, What is it that people are professing trust in? And of course, if you're looking for counter signs, they were there in plenty as well. Um, people 
not trusting the uh, views of, of Fauci. And, and it's interesting that Pinocchio has had a whole second life here as uh, the elongated version of Fauci's nose, whether it appears as a Dr. Fawcett or whether it appears simply lengthened in that way. So throughout 2020 and 2021, we've had ample occasion to start wondering about the infrastructures of trust and distrust that make both of these renditions of a Dr. Fauci possible in some sense. So how should we think about this? And often when one is wondering, it's a good idea to go back to the basics of why we believe the things we believe and what we're supposed to be doing as citizens. So Immanuel Kant in 1784 wrote a very well-known essay, a very short one, called What is Enlightenment? Of course, it was in German, but the operative portion translated into English reads this way, enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed immaturity. Immaturity is the inability to use one's understanding without <laughs> guidance from another. So enlightenment was supposed to be the capacity that each of us now has encoded in our own education, educated belief system to be able to trust things that we hear and see about the world without needing anybody else's guidance to do so. And what is this immaturity all about? So another great philosopher of the social sciences, Michel Foucault, uh, wrote an essay on Kant, and he pointed out that there were three examples that Kant gave of areas where the mature citizen was supposed to be using her maturity to make judgments for herself. So you're immature when a book takes the place of your understanding, when a spiritual director takes the place of your conscience, and when a doctor decides for us what our diet is to be. So you can you know, interpret diet metaphorically in some sense. Immaturity would be to trust unquestioningly what the book or the spiritual director or the doctor says. Instead, you're supposed to be exercising in some sense your own judgment. Well, what has happened to that Kantian view of individual enlightenment and maturity to exercise your reason to weigh the decisions of the world? One thing that's happened is that we've written de facto a new constitution for modernity, which was not in the wording of the original revolutionary era constitutions of the late 18th century. So you, one might talk today about the 21st century social compact, which in a way seems to turn the clock back on Kantian enlightenment. So today we have masses of areas, practically all of our lives, in which we delegate authority to experts precisely to tell us how to behave, metaphorically what our diet should be. We grant them epistemic authority to know for us how we should be exercising judgment and then when we refuse, when we in some sense take the Fauci-Nocchio line, then it becomes a problem because people are not trusting science because they should have been trusting science. So this is a huge evolution in 200 or so years away from a view of enlightenment that said it is a good thing to doubt, it's a good thing to trust your own judgment, to a position that we're in now where distrust of an institutionalized authority is seen as a problem in and of itself. So I think even to begin to get to grips with the state we're in, we have to begin by recognizing that these expert institutions that we've created are not simply telling us the state of the world in an unmediated fashion so that we can trust those claims in a direct way. Instead, they're exercising authority that is political in the very same way that our elected bodies are political or our politically appointed bodies are political. And I think one can talk about at least three kinds of moves that most expert agencies and bodies and groups of experts make that could be translated directly into political terms. So the first thing that they do is representation every bit as much as 
electoral bodies do or other political representatives do, except that representation in the expert arena carries a double meaning. On the one hand, representing nature and the world as it is, and on the other hand, standing for a wider group of knowledge. So you don't have communal knowledge, it's passed through these bodies of experts. And here are some representations from different points in the history of the development of the pandemic. As you see, they're quite celebratory. They're representing science. Operation Warp Speed's Triumph. Warp Speed was the name of the vaccine development um, mission that Donald Trump's presidency set in place. COVID vaccine trials were a triumph. I mean, so this word triumph came from all different quarters and it's a presenting science itself as a triumphalist enterprise. And I've heard this spoken in you know, routine exchanges many, many times. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was on a panel where there were just two panelists and the other person was a public health expert and her takeaway from what we should have learned is that we should celebrate the triumph of science and you know the real problem is in citizens who didn't uh, who didn't take that on board in the way that it was intended so representation here is science speaking on behalf of the people but also representing itself in the winning role as having the solutions a second mode of political operation is what i will call aggregation and that is to be taking disparate sets of views and making some kind of coherence out of them. So this is my reinterpretation of the famous supposedly Indian legend of the blind men and the elephant. I now think that the blind men represent disciplinary silos and they're not blind at all. It's only they're relatively blind in relation to each other. So there's nothing wrong with the rope maker seeing the tail as a piece of rope. It's just that it's not the whole elephant in the room. So, you know, aggregation to some extent in the political realm is very few representatives aggregating the views of an entire polity. But aggregation in the expert community sense is putting together these disparate modes of understanding in different ways. So here is a very well-known example, the famous hockey stick curve that has occasioned a great deal of debate in climate circles. And this is from the IPCC. I'm sure this image is known to many in this audience. But note what it says. It says data from thermometers, red, and from tree rings, corals, ice cores, and historical records, blue. So it's data from all those different sources, thermometers, tree rings, corals, ice cores, and historical records. And these are very disparate areas of study. They have their own modes of representation, interpretation, their own views of how accurate data are and how you put together data from multiple different sets of observations and so forth. They deal in different data sets. Nevertheless, this one curve is an amalgam of this entirety of different scientific communities coming together with very disparate ideas of how to make a synthesis of the whole. And yet it becomes so well known as a curve that it's actually called the hockey stick curve just because of the slope. And any of you who have seen Al Gore's famous Nobel Prize winning film, An Inconvenient Truth, will remember him going up in this little device, you know, to show just how steep the hockey stick part of this was. Um, and yet it is, um, as you know, a very contested uh, mode of representation of what's happening even with the climate. A third political move is what I will call bridging. And that is bridging between those things that you know and those things that you need to know in order to perform any kind of political action. And scientists need to do this every bit as much as politicians need to do this. Did people know exactly what was the right amount of money to pump into the economy and at what levels and to what people in the wake of the pandemic or after the first early months when everything got shut down? This has operated in different ways in different countries. I'm sure that people like Diane know the details of this much 
better than I do because I don't follow only the economics, but the very ways in which money was distributed was you know, quite contested, even in a country like Germany with a great deal of economic and social solidarity. People complained that big companies like Lufthansa were getting paid off at a much larger rate than they should have been compared with other people. And in America, we've had other ideas about you know, what would have been the right economic response. I don't think those debates are dying down anytime soon. But if we take that bridging idea into account and go back to thinking about the distrust of Dr. Fauci, we find the debate laid out in a very clear way around what we should be expecting of science and what kind of load the scientific enterprise will bear. So this Peter Navarro is a somewhat notorious advisor from the Trump era, but look at what he says about why trust in Fauci is not warranted. So when we were building new masks capacity in record time, Fauci was flip-flopping on the use of masks. So inconsistency. This is something every lawyer knows. If you can catch a witness out saying one thing at one time and a different thing at a different time, you should not trust that person. This is a sort of ABC primer of trustworthiness. You don't trust people who tell you one thing one time and, and a different thing a different time. Of course, Dr. Fauci had a response to that, and the response to that was that, yes, sorry about the mixed message in the beginning. It was detrimental in getting the message across. But once it became clear people can spread the virus without knowing they're sick, public health leaders realized the message needed to change. So again, for people familiar with science policy, this is a very familiar move. It's the linear move that as knowledge shifts, policy also shifts. And therefore, what was flip-flopping in Peter Navarro's version of the story becomes in Fauci's version a naturalized model of progress that yes, of course, we were confused at the beginning, that's only natural, but as knowledge grew, as it became more stabilized and evolved, public health leaders did the responsible thing. They also changed their message in accordance with that view. And then when people went back and asked the White House whether this is still in the Trump era, whether they were you know, purposely trying to trip Fauci up by doing so-called campaign style opposition research, and then uh, the then uh, White House spokesperson, Kaylee McEnany, uh, said the White House had simply been responding to questions from reporters. So this is ordinary democratic due diligence. People are asking us these questions and we're simply responding. Uh, but there you see the difficulties of the bridging exercise and the fact that what the scientists are trying to do in bridging between imperfect knowledge and a claim that will somehow stand up as persuasive is no different from what politicians are doing in the same sense in assuring people that they're acting well in safeguarding the future for people. So with that, let's move to some more granular uh, impressions of the pandemic and what we can begin to take away from that. So I was in an institution, my husband who's in the audience here will also recognize these things. Uh, we suddenly started getting notes a little before March 13th. March 13th was the D-Day on which things got shut down on campus, all the students were sent away and we were told that we had to teach remotely and could not come back. But the intimations came with very little sense of what else was in the works at that time. Probably decisions had already been made, but we were given to understand that this was an experimental phase. So this was a direct response to me. Um, as the university moves rapidly toward preparation to teach remotely if necessary. So look at the date, it's March 8th. Uh, we need to pilot an online class session. So this is all the language of experimentation and nothing has yet been decided. But two days later, the president of Harvard says, we will begin transitioning to virtual instruction 
Our goal is to have this complete by Monday, March 23rd, the end of the traditional break that we have in the spring semester. And then students are asked not to return to campus after spring recess and to meet academic requirements remotely until further notice. It's a very bland, emotionless sentence, but one student of mine who happens to ha be of Irish heritage um, told me that he left his dormitory at nine o'clock to come to class, or a few minutes before nine, to come to his nine o'clock class. And when he arrived, I mean, he left in a normal way. When he arrived, he said people were looking ashen. And he said, what's going on? And he said, we've been told that we have to clear out by the end of the week. And he said, since this kid has a sense of humor, he said that when he was going back, he found everybody clutching bottles under their arm. Uh, so that was you know, a morning time experience. <laughs> and it had that effect that, that you know, people just didn't have any idea of what had hit them. Uh, even though, of course, just the chronology shows you that some behind the scenes planning had of course been going on. And so you know, it was a very shocking um, landing, as it were, of the, um, you know, of the what should we do, given, you know, what we know of the events that are coming uh, at us. So for the last two years, there's been every attempt on the policy front and also in the institutional setting uh, to act as if uncertainty doesn't exist, as if we know, you know, what the right thing to do is at different times. So these are just things, again, artifacts from the Kennedy School. These are different um, uh, cover stories from the Kennedy School's uh, house magazine. You'll see that they're devoted uh, to um, the pandemic, uh, not surprisingly. Um, but HKS faculty teach leaders how to make better decisions amid uncertainty, and the graphic is interesting because it's linear. Uh, it suggests that the arrows are pointing in a particular di direction. It suggests that at every bend in the pencil road, you have some you know, tree-like, if this, then do this, if not that, then do that. I mean, you know, there's a kind of orderliness to the whole thing. And at the same time, we've been exposed to a constant barrage of messaging. So the first one on the left is uh, a play on the school's motto, ask what you can do. This is borrowed from John F. Kennedy's famous speech about, you know, ask not what your country can do, but ask what you can do for your country. So that becomes mask what you can do. Uh, I don't know what the consultants were actually paid to produce the messaging, but in any event, um, you see that it's now routinized to the extent that there are all these little plastic gadgets. And of course, this is not just the Kennedy School, right? I mean, multiply this hundreds of thousands of times across the northern world or across the rich world, and you see that we are in a highly disciplined environment in which the very idea of uncertainty doesn't exist. And uh, moreover, that it's a communal sensibility that's being urged upon us. So keep HKS healthy, keep Harvard healthy. I don't know if you had keep Cambridge healthy messages as much as we did, but it was very much the good of the institution. And this was one of the later arrivals that came into being along with the term active eating and active drinking. I had never heard that eating and drinking could be either active or passive <laughs> until this set of signs began emerging. And the idea is that when your utensils are down and therefore you are not actively eating, you have to put your mask back up. And this was actually being imposed in the Kennedy School cafeteria. I mean, one time I was sitting there, I was still eating, my companion was not. And somebody came by and insisted that my companion should put their mask back up, you know, while I was sitting across the table doing something else. All right, so this is how, you know, an emergency lands upon us. A certain kind of infantilizing. I mean, this is not 
Kantian maturity, we were not allowed to be mature. We had to become immature. We had to become, in a sense, childlike and follow instructions in the most childish language. I mean, you know, if you were taught the imperial language as I was, and I'll come back to that, there's a certain violation of the ear in being told messages like this. I mean, you know, it, it reads as trivializing, I mean, you know, as if you have no judgmental space of your own. And as I say, this is not, I'm just giving you ethnographic observations from one institution, but we've all been exposed to the same kind of phenomenon in one way or another. So one of the things that has kept me sane is doing research, and we were able fortunately with uh, support from the National Science Foundation of the US and also from a private foundation, Schmidt Futures, uh, to be able to carry out a still ongoing study looking at responses in 16 countries to the crisis. And in the Q&A period, I'd be happy to say a bit more about that. My co-leader of the project is Professor Stephen Hilgartner of Cornell University, who is a close colleague and a very good friend. And it was interesting that all of the 60 or so researchers who were involved in the project, and a couple of them are here in the audience, Jack Stillow and Warren Pierce, um, we were able, I think, to kind of cast a lifeline to each other and keep ourselves going because the observation was not being done in solitude. It was being, I mean, it was very much shared misery. And, you know, it, this is a prescription for doing group research find other people willing to share your misery. And you know, so even in the Zoom environment, there were moments of you know, sort of hilariousness as people's cats walked across their desks when we were having group meetings and you know, all these sort of familiar intrusions that I'm sure people became used to. But we were coming at this project with theoretical tools already in hand. And for me, one of those was this idea of civic epistemologies, that is, to what extent is the public reason that Diane already mentioned something that is conditioned by institutional structures and predilections and preferences that are baked deep into a culture's collective ways of doing things. And again, as some of you know, I have operationalized this idea of civic epistemologies in connection with particularly my research on biotechnology, but equally my research on climate and looking especially at three countries, the US, Britain, and Germany. And so there are differences, stylized differences. Of course, you can find anything anywhere, and ethnographers are always deeply put off at my attempting to generalize at the nation state level, but nevertheless, you know, just like Galileo said, still it moves, I say still it holds still a lot of the time, that these are institutional groundings that don't go away so easily. And so some of these things that in America, public knowledge making tends to be adversarial, pluralist, people fighting each other out, whereas in Germany, it tends to be much more consensual, I mean, even in the discussions we were having right before my lecture, this sort of thing came out in a conversation that we were having across cultural lines. So for me, one of the hypothesizing questions was, as this COVID crisis unfolds, are we going to see patterns that are similar to what I have seen in other times and places across these countries? So the idea that you know, that, that science to some degree stands apart, is purified from institutional constraints, and science has no bias and values built into it. This is very much part of America's understanding, so that when you have these logical conflicts, at the end of it, you are establishing the truth. That is the, the presumption. And indeed, um, this was borne out to some extent by the way that the last presidential election was characterized. So when President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris took the stand finally after several days of wrangling about who actually had won the election, uh, the screens behind them were flashing different signs. 
And one of them was that this was, election was about choosing sides. And it was a claim about the people. The people, the American public, have chosen science. Well, if they did, it's well known that they did it by a very small margin. So that's an unfortunate feature of this victory. Um, and that has come back to plague us and haunt us in various ways. So what did the people choose by way of representation? I like this particular front page of the New York Times from a particular day in history because it's so quantified and so modeled, but also because of this one story that appears on the, the upper left that Pfizer and Moderna vaccines may offer lasting protection study finds. So this, as you will understand, goes very much with the triumphalist idea of science having ridden in to the rescue and solved the problem. And if you click on the story itself, it says that the vaccines made by both Pfizer, BioNTech, and, and Moderna um, set off a persistent immune reaction. And the findings add to growing evidence that most people immunized with the mRNA vaccines may not need boosters so long as the virus and its variants do not evolve much beyond their current forms, which is not guaranteed. So, I mean, anyway, I'll leave you to think about that. <laughs> but other people were thinking about that as well. And to some extent, I think that it's those logics of opposition and resistance that we have to try to understand in order to rethink our institutions and come back to this question of what do we do about trust and distrust. Is it wrong that vaccines can cause injury and death? No, it's not wrong. Will it be solved by doing what my public health colleague just a couple of weeks ago was saying? Teach them more probability, teach them more mathematics. Then they will understand that the probabilities do not favor your dying or getting severely injured, but you know, countries like Norway suspended AstraZeneca because of numbers that were not very high. So, you know, one must ask, and then, of course, it being America, the aborted fetal cells, is a completely different and moral line of inquiry, which, if you wanted to oppose it, would have to be opposed on different grounds from the one that says vaccines cause injury and death. And then this happens to be in an area of Cambridge that's very familiar to us residents of Cambridge. It's Moderna's um, head office in Cambridge near MIT. But note that the, the objections here have to do with a moral argument and not an epistemic argument. So vaccines for all, free the vaccine. You know, this is a sign of people deconstructing the triumphalist claim, but doing it on very different grounds, not just a question of epistemic uncertainty or certainty. And then, of course, I've been watching with a particularly keen eye what's happening on this side of the Atlantic, helped along by our collaborators in the UK. But I've been struck at the number of times when personal probity and willingness to follow the rules has been the basis for heightened distrust. So, oops, that's the wrong direction. Um, you know, even the Queen's throwaway remark fits in with my sort of characterization of British civic epistemology, depending very much on a juxtaposition of skills and knowledge, yes, for sure, but also a sense of personal probity. So, you know, the Queen referred to the health secretary, Matt Hancock, as poor man. I mean, you know, it's, um, well, it's a cultural moment that one can analyze in all kinds of ways, but the stress is on what kind of individual this is and that, you know, he's fallen short of expectations in a particular way. So this is, when people were talking about Fauci's inability to tell the truth, it was not, nobody came forward and said, poor man. I mean, you know, that's, it's hard to convey exactly the difference in valence, but, but if you think whether it's about you know, parties at Downing Street or 
Dublin and Cummings or whatever, there's been a succession of these debates in England about whether individual people were following the rules laid down for the majority of people. And that has been a recurrent strand in, you know, are these institutions trustworthy? Are they telling us one thing and then behaving internally in a very different way? That has not been a kind of critique that has come up in America. In America, it's far more about whether the models are right or wrong and whether people are exaggerating the data in one way or another, not about the willingness to follow, the willingness of the rulers to follow the rules imposed on those being governed. In Germany, on the other hand, a different set of stories, far less controversy over the findings of public health and science writ large. That's what the, the, the uh, comparative research shows. And indeed, the German National Prize was awarded to Elena Bux, who is the chair of the Ethics Committee. But in her acceptance, um, the, um, or in justifying why she was the recipient of the award, there's a bit of German political culture and civic epistemology that pops up there. Ms. Books regularly succeeds in bringing together the multiple perspectives of different scientific disciplines and communicating the result of these deliberations in a clear and accessible language. So this is the country of Habermas and communicative rationality, but you see there in one sentence evidence of the value placed on aggregation and on bridging the two of the moves that I was talking about before, because bringing together the, mul the multiple perspectives is a very important feature of the way in which German political culture forges assent or consent on troubling sets of facts where otherwise there might be disagreement, and then communicating the result in a clear and accessible language. There's a great deal of political theory built into that little clause that you know, the people have to understand and it has to be clear and accessible, but that's the bridging language operating out in a different way from the way it did in the US. So this is at least, you know, I mean, this is a very shallow demonstration of much richer databases that we have, but that these civic epistemologies play out in unexpected ways when a new crisis emerges there does seem to be some evidence that this is um, a useful way of looking at these things. So in the meantime, of course, we do see skepticism appearing in different ways, but around the world, and you know, we see figures like Robert F. Kennedy, the son of the um, assassinated senator in the US, appearing at rallies in Germany saying, you know, why he is anti-vax. But the inflections are again interestingly different. I mean, so don't give Gates a chance, but this is really about globalization. It's about the imposition of a particular kind of globalist economic ideology and with that a flattening of the earth that the German right-wing extremists have fought in the same way as right-wing extremists everywhere else in the world but that is not the register in which American protests have mostly taken shape. And then, of course, your immediate uh, trans-channel neighbor is always interesting to look at as well. Um, and there it's interesting the degree to which the technocratic ideal of centralization has caused a single person to put on the mantle of state in both an epistemic and a political sense. So Macron was spoofed in various ways. Memes started appearing, and indeed you see there uh, the beginnings of a meme. But it was because he presented himself as having read the epidemiological literature and understanding it better than or in advance of his appointed scientific com committees. And so, you know, he is the embodiment of this uh, state that has run in accordance with the principles of technocracy with its grand, ec grand école and its centralization in Paris. And now all of this sort of incorporated into a single uh, 
imperial body, the body of the sole individual who represents both the state and its knowledge in an unchallengeable way. Now, obviously, these things are not really unchallenged, but it's interesting to see how the dynamics of state making appear. And against that, you see a model of opposition that is saying, no, you know, French citizenship is not about the technocracy taken over. We pay our taxes. We respect the law. We are citizens. And this is the mobilization against the, uh, um, the vaccination pass that uh, is now, you know, considered uh, de rigueur to enter certain kinds of public spaces in France. And she's dressed up as the Statue of Liberty and holding up. I mean, you know, so it's, it's an enactment of a sense of a different sense of how democracy and trust or distrust should be playing out. I mean, but not the Kantian sense. It's because we pay our taxes and we respect the law. I mean, we are part of this citizenship and you know, this almost sacral idea of citizenship in France that all citizens are alike under the, in the eyes of the law. That is the sensibility that is being invoked. In the meantime, back in America, of course, things are gradually ending and now I want to close off with a couple of, again, ethnographic uh, observations on my own, you know, sort of position in looking at all of this. So about a week ago, we got a notice saying that FAS stands for Fa Faculty of Arts and Sciences. So Faculty of Arts and Sciences will authorize um, teaching without a mask and it's ending starting on Thursday. This is uh, I believe Thursday already of last week. But then there follows a, a set of restrictions with no explanation about where these restrictions are coming from. So only those faculty who can always maintain a six feet distance. My teaching classroom was authorized to be a classroom in which maskless teaching was allowed. But if, as I and my co-instructors do, we move around the classroom to come closer to the students, then we were not supposed to go unmasked. Um, need I tell you that these requirements uh, did not have a scientific basis that was ever explained to us, whether they had any basis or not, you can judge for yourself. And the sting came in the tail. Many of us, our colleagues, I can assure you, were too bored to read all the way down. I did read all the way down because for me this is research material. And all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden it says complete a COVID-19 test via color, that's our local testing service, at least twice weekly, even if their usual testing cadence is less frequent. So testing cadence is just the, the routine that we, uh, cadence is the name given at Harvard. But, so for normal faculty, for more than a year it's been Oh, for almost a year, sorry. It's been once a week. So now for the privilege of going unmasked under all these criteria, we were supposed to get tested twice a week. The Kennedy School, which hasn't been very good about explaining things, uh, meantime, a couple of days later, sent out a message which simply said this. Effective Monday, March 14th. So March 14th is a very important date because it's precisely two years. And I think the logic here was that they did not want to go into year three of the pandemic. So starting March 14th, masks will no longer be required. And although this is the school at which the slogan of, you know, masks up, you know, cover or consume, whatever that stuff came into play, they did not have any additional testing requirements. So the Faculty of Arts and Sciences operating under the umbrella of the same university said that you had to change your testing cadence. The Kennedy School simply says, as of March 14th, all these restrictions are lifted. And then some revised guidance came from the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, which no longer has the testing requirement in it, but there was no explanation to say why that was no longer in it, or even that it was no longer there. 
So if you had blinked the first time and hadn't noticed it, you wouldn't notice that it had been instituted and then five days later also lifted in some sense. Right, so let's go back then to Emmanuel and you know, ask again, you know, what is enlightenment? And you know, it's as if we're not allowed by our institutions. I mean, so Kant had no idea that we would be delegating responsibility out to these institutions that would develop their own political theory of how to represent, how to aggregate, and how to bridge across domains of uncertainty. And therefore, he imagined that each of us alone would be able to think of the contingencies and judge for ourselves. And in a way, I think that the philosopher should have been reading his literature. Another of the conclusions I came to in the course of the pandemic is that Hamlet is an STS play. And I'd be happy to discuss this point with anybody over drinks, but <laughs> this is the passage that I think I want to end on where Horatio sees the ghost and says, oh, day and night, but this is wondrous strange. And Hamlet says, and therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than I dreamt of in your philosophy. So here is Shakespeare talking to Kant and suggesting that in order to understand reality, maybe you have to open yourself up to contingencies that the logic of the philosopher does not fully encompass. Thank you for that marvellous lecture, and thank you also for agreeing to some um, questions. We've got roving mics, um, if they're ready to go. And um, let me try and see who would like to ask the first question. Thank you. Um, I'm quite interested in the uh, inter-country inter comparisons, um, because I think, you know, I kind of agree with you, there's no, I, there's, there's no like, fundamental reason why you should think that things shouldn't happen. And, um, but the, a couple of the particular ones that you mentioned, you mentioned that uh, in the UK, there's been a lot of focus on the personal hypocrisy of leaders and that that hadn't happened so much in the US. But I immediately thought of Gavin Newsom, Stacey Abrams and London Breed who were all criticized in the US for failing to follow mask mandates that they had either supported in Stacey Abrams' case or actually been the person to implement in the other two cases. And I'm sure that, you know, obviously you, you gave an example in the UK and I can think of some anecdotes off the top of my head in the US, but I was wondering, is there more, um, you know, more to it than that? You know, we can trade an anecdotal impression, but my, basically my anecdotal impression, impression was completely different, that that has been a huge part of the discourse in the US. And similarly with the anti-globalization angle to opposition to vaccines, my exposure to anti-vaccine sentiment from the US has focused hugely on globalization as part of a long-standing opposition on parts, in parts of the US right to like the UN and the International Monetary Fund and the World Trade Organization and basically any international organization that they see as kind of a threatening to US sovereignty and power. So, so sorry, questions, not speeches. Yeah, so, um, so, given my anecdotal impression is the opposite of yours, what reason should I have? Like, you know, I guess I we imagine should all you go back to the US to and that decide that this is something to be decided on the grounds of truth versus falsehood, as opposed to what I think an interpretive social scientist might do, which is to say that the ways in which the same object is given meaning in different cultures varies, and that there is an enormous amount of historical learning and exemplification that suggests that the ways in which people are held to account differ from one society to another. And that, I think, is something that needs to be taken on board by institutions that are seeking to reconstitute themselves. There are moments where those parallelisms that you're talking about do not exist. There's also the question of, is this best decided in a tit for tat, you know, 
my interpretation of your culture is different from your interpretation of mine or whatever, um, and instead look to historical trajectories. I mean, in what ways have people chosen to apply praise or blame in different places? And if you look at, for instance, in Britain, a succession of crises, you find a tendency to personalize, a tendency to say that the way in which we secure a government of experts that is operating in accordance with norms is uh, a demonstration of a commitment to public life and public probity, uh, even proposals that there should be an honor code for civil servants and things like that, which are less common or impossible in a country like mine, the US, where a much higher percentage of the political, of the policy class gets thrown out with every election and therefore the top layers are far more politicized and therefore to some degree one expects a certain kind of politicization but not a betrayal of the truth. I mean, so people are on, uh, feel themselves to be on firmer ground challenging people, other people, because they're denying the truth. A phenomenon like count the number of lies. I mean, you know, Boris Johnson is known in UK political culture for not for being at the most lighthearted, a fibber, right? But the sort of day by day, you know, sort of almost like climate change count of the number of lies the president tells and indicated that developed during the Trump regime uh, is a fairly extraordinary artifact of a political culture. In Germany, you wouldn't find that at all. You know, there's not a sort of, an, an entire industry of fact checking now has grown up, even though, you know, you go back to Hannah Arendt, you know, in the 60s and 70s and, She's talking about the fact that politicians all tell lies. Nevertheless, there's some kind of presumption that when it comes to things about which you should tell the truth, even the politician can be held to an external indicator of truth. So, you know, the, um, I'm sure that along with other people in this audience, we could supply you with a reading list, but that's, you know, it's a matter of persuasion that you know, can't be undertaken fully in a discussion of this sort. Yes, uh, thank, thank you, thank you, Sheila, uh, for, for a very, very helpful lecture. Uh, and, and you drew out very nicely examples of different modes of reasoning that exist amongst those who perhaps have been classified as resistors or skeptics to some of the more conventional policy regimes around COVID. I, I, I think we could turn that around also, could we, to those, if, if you like, who have uh, accepted mainstream policy or science or epistemic claims or effectiveness of vaccines. But even there, we see differences in reasoning. And, and in particular, I, I'm interested in the idea of moral reasoning here and how this plays into your civic epistemologies. Because it seems to me at the very heart of debates about COVID policy are a set of moral judgments about life, the value of life, how one reasons about mortality and morbidity, the consequences for different age cohorts and demographics. And these are moral judgments, not epistemic ones. I just wonder how moral reasoning, the differences in moral reasoning, feed into your thinking about civic epistemologies. Thank well, you. so Mike, thanks for the question. Uh, the, uh, I mean, I guess the only place I would take issue with anything you asked is uh, the separation between moral reasoning and epistemic reasoning. I mean, I think that how one reasons about the episteme is through and through colored with what one thinks about the morality. So I think you're completely right that positions on things like vaccines in all of the societies that we're looking at have to some extent been uh, taken on board as responsibility questions as well. Uh, so you find many uh, statements and, and um, 
sort of professions of faith by people that even granted uncertainty, they're willing to put the uncertainty aside in favor of greater restrictions on themselves even because they don't want to endanger other people, whether this is their partners or their um, other people in vulnerable groups that they are in close proximity with. Uh, so for instance, the sort of emergence of the mask as uh, this is science, uh, that entire rhetoric has been underwritten by a strong moral sensibility that regardless what the judgmental factors around this are, we are better off masking because um, on a balance of probabilities, we don't want to endanger other people. Um, but, um, but that said, the question of who is actually responsible to whom uh, has been one of these really contested things. I mean, so one can write an entire comparative history of the way in which constitutional litigation has played out. So this is a quintessential area where uh, a public health de decree is held up against other normative claims, right? I mean, so in the US, we've had a slew of cases about whether religious institutions should be subjected to the same um, public health restrictions as other places. And it's been interesting to observe the dichotomy in the Supreme Court about the logic by which you either say religious institutions should be exempted or religious institutions should not be exempted. So for instance, you know, you can, some justices have said it's ridiculous to think that religious institutions should be subjected to the same guidelines as hair salons and, and restaurants because the reasons why people go there are different. They go there because of being part of a moral community and not otherwise. Whereas the people who favor those restrictions have said, well, this is a uniform rule covering you know, any place where more than 50 people can congregate or 100 people can congregate. Religious institutions fall under that umbrella. Therefore, the numerical logic should apply and not this question of values about what kind of citizenship right are you articulating in that moment. So I think that the point about values is, you know, the point about moral judgment is well taken, but I think that the how one sees the world in epistemic terms is shot through with the normative consequences that one wants to elicit from it. And these court judgments are a place where you can see these different normative epistemic uh, combinations sort of working off of each other on the same factual context. So I think that's an interesting piece of the database that we're collecting. Thank you, Sheila. N next question was uh, Hi. there. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you, Sheila, for a very interesting and thought-provoking lecture. Um, my slide is about, uh, my, my question is about your slide on uh, uh, political flip-flapping, flip-flopping. Yes. Um, my name is Ryan. I'm a PhD student in epistemology at UCL SES, currently studying at Downing College in Cambridge. Um, so my question is about temporal uncertainty. And now there's you know a paradigm shift towards okay, uh, proliferation of evidence in both abundance and type. Um, but this contributes to some sort of temporal uncertainty. Um, so my question is, you know, we're guided by you know you said the policy follows the knowledge, in that we're guided by science, but that science is always changing. So. My question is, well, simply, how do politicians still keep the strength of their convictions at the same time as being guided by science, uh, science Bayesian science, that's com constantly changing and constantly subject to this temporal uncertainty? Yeah, thanks for the question. So although the science may be always changing, um, I think it's become a kind of habit like shrugging that politicians uh, feel more comfortable, and scientists who advise them also feel more comfortable saying, this is what the science says at any given moment. So the instant at which you cut into the political debate, it's always represented as the science is not changing. I mean, in a way, that was the point I was trying to make with the New York Times article about how Pfizer and Moderna studies say, you know, would not need boosters. And that was dated June of last year. and. You know, I got my booster in, on November 6th, and you know, it was not very many months, and some people were already getting their boosters before. 
And there was a little proviso, unless the variant shows up. But that was not what was highlighted. It, it doesn't begin with saying, you know, provisionally on the basis of what we know at the moment. It says what the science says or what the studies say. I mean, it's not even some studies, it's the studies and, you know, that kind of language. So there's a tendency to privilege the science at the moment as if it is the science. Now, admittedly, it would be maybe COVID fatigue would be worsened if people stuck in all the time further provisos, I mean, to the extent that we know something now. But I think that even in the midst of a crisis, it might be, uh, it might be worth considering how much more provisional language could get without sacrificing uh, the people's confidence that this is the best way to go now. You know, in, in countries like Sweden and um, the Netherlands, where the central government did not impose as strict conditions, uh, my, in particular, my Dutch friend was saying that social distancing rules were obeyed more firmly than they seemed to be in America. I mean, he gave a particular example of a sequence of meetings that were held first in Amsterdam where nobody was obeying social distancing rules, but then subsequently The Hague and Rotterdam. And by that time, the, the messaging had gone out that the Amsterdam crowd had been too unruly and was exposing people to greater harm. And you know, so within a matter of days, a different public understanding came into play, not because it was a centralized thing enacted from the top down, but because of a direct appeal uh, by the prime minister in that case toward an idea of intelligent citizenship. Um, and then people accepted it. Now, you know, all of this goes back to political culture. I don't know what somebody claiming that you should act on the basis of intelligent citizenship would elicit in the US. I'm not sure what exactly, how exactly such a term would even be understood. But the point is that provisionality is not inconsistent with public judgment, public decisions, and a public willingness to adhere to those decisions. How to strike that balance, that itself has to be thought through in diverse political cultures. In the meeting we had right before this lecture, someone correctly pointed out that the state, the government, is not one thing, and I suspect that different institutions inside of the government might answer that question of how do we treat provisional information in very different ways, whether you're sitting in a Department of Defense or a Department of Public Health, the judgments may be very different. Nonetheless, I think probably all our institutions could stand to make their epistemic claims a shade or two less definite and not resort to this blanket of the science in all of these places where it is invoked. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, kind of related to that last point, I was wondering about the like public apologies during COVID, like how many were there, <laughs> if any, um, what were they for, who made them, and then what was kind of the impact of public apologies on trust? So what was the key word there? Uh, public apologies. Oh, the role of public apologies in, um, well, We've had a president who didn't ever apologize, and the stock in trade was never to apologize. I'm not, I mean, you know, where we are seeing public apologies in America these days uh, are far more, I mean, not around COVID, but around something completely different, the, the systemic anti-racist, um, well, systemic racist biases and, and gender biases and so forth. As far as I can tell, public apologies in America are not very effective, partly because I think people don't really care. I mean, to take one example from our own area of stuff that we're talking about, um, President Biden's science advisor was made to resign because of bullying Eric Lander, very famous name in the public health and um, biomedical arena, before he resigned, he had made a public apology, which was immediately deemed to be insufficient and not a career rescuing move. 
But I think that that goes back to the person who challenged me with the first question, that it's not really about personal character here. It's about violating a certain set of normative positions to pick up on Mike's point about you know, what constitutes right belief and that foundational commitment to the belief as needing to be right as opposed to the vessel which could be perfect or imperfect is a different thing in America. If the vessel is imperfect, then the apology might work because you're saying, you know, it was my fault, etc. I think in the East Asian countries, that culture of public apology works yet differently because there's, particularly in Japan among our cases, such a huge tradition of stigmatization if you bring a threat into the community at all. And there, the apology is deemed de rigueur. You have to do it. It doesn't absolve you, but you still have to go through the ritual because without that, you would not be compensating for the fact that you put your community at risk in, in a certain way. So thanks for the question. Thanks very much. Um, so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the international study uh, with, uh, I think it was 16 different countries. Um, and in particular, it's actually sort of on the basis of what has been asked in previous questions and some of your responses, where there's some interesting contrasts to draw between Scandinavian countries, for example, and the role of the central government in, in the way in which they uh, impose certain restrictions. Um, so I'm from Norway, and, and one thing that was always done in Norway was people who didn't like the restrictions would often look to Sweden and say, look at how well Sweden are doing. And then people who sort of not necessarily liked the restrictions but were in favor of them would say things like, look at how badly Sweden are doing. And they would, they would sort of blame it on, on the government in Sweden not imposing certain restrictions that it, you know, it wasn't the, the official government engaging in those restrictions, but the health officials uh, or um, and, and health the, organizations, sorry. Yeah. And the question is? Uh, well, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about uh, the, uh, the choice of countries in the study and, and the study uh, more generally, given that you... you, you know. Yeah, well, um, thanks for asking about that. I mean, methodologically, this was anything but pure because we had a very limited amount of money and had to persuade most people to participate in this study in a voluntary way and we weren't actually paying, I mean we were paying one, well, two postdocs and then one postdoc to coordinate the study, that's where the money went. So everybody was working for free and so it was people deciding they wanted to be part of the study in order to get a sense of what the other people were doing. But it broke down into three typologies. One, the economically more libertarian, weak state, strong individualism, etc two, the social democratic countries, and three, the island nations with a very strong sense of border control and you know, the, um, the casting of the disease as an imported thing from the outside. New Zealand, regrettably, was not part of our study, but Australia, Singapore, Taiwan, and China were, and these are some of the countries with, where the target was immediately seen to be the virus and its spread, as opposed to social behavior and how the receiving body should take the, the virus on board. So we did end up having three broad typologies of national response. The specific point you raised, who were people looking to as their reference country? You know, are they doing better or worse? That is something that we explicitly asked about. And the answers vary. I mean, I haven't yet had a chance to see if there's anything meaty to be gleaned out of that. But my question back to you would be, well, but were Norwegians generally obedient regardless whether they thought the Swedes were good or bad? And my feeling is, yes, they were. I mean, similarly, the Danes were happy that they didn't have as bad statistics as the Swedes, whereas the Swedes come back and say, well, we made a mistake. We didn't take care of the care homes. We should have had a different set of restrictions. But you know, the idea that we take everybody over 70 and impose a different restriction on them and expect them to abide by it. In America, you would have had rioting in the streets if you tried to do that to over 70 year olds because that would have been seen as discriminating on the basis of age and you know, a different set of constitutional presumptions at play under there. But again, it's obviously an extremely interesting question. I doubt that, I mean, I'm sorry we didn't have 
infinite amounts of money to do a well-designed case in the middle of an emerging crisis, but we do have some interesting data nevertheless. Thanks. Well, Sheila, it's all fascinating, and I'm sure we're going to carry on discussing it um, over a uh, drink now. Uh, so, uh, please, I hope you can stay, and I think we go out to this side and we'll be told where to go and carry on the discussions. But first of all, please join me in thanking Sheila Jessenoff for a wonderful, wonderful lecture. Thank you.